Hi, I'm Professor Mohammed Omar, and today we're going to talk about the Gauss-Lucas theorem, a surprising theorem about the location of the roots of the derivatives of a polynomial with respect to where the roots of the original polynomial lie. So we'll let f of z be a polynomial with roots r1 through rn in the complex plane. Then the roots of the derivative happen to lie in the convex hull. of the roots of the original polynomial. Now what does that mean? So say for example in the complex plane we had our original polynomial having exactly four roots. Okay, so imagine having saran wrap around these four points. Imagining these points being pinned to the complex plane, placing saran wrap around all of them, and filling that in. That filled in space is the convex hull of these four points. Okay, it turns out the proof of this theorem is actually quite elegant. Um, so this is an interesting, surprising result with an elegant proof as well. And it, it allows us to see um, a lot of other things that don't seem to uh, be clear from the theorem directly, but for example, um, if the polynomial f has real roots, this forces its derivative to have real roots because the roots, if they are real, would lie on the real line and the convex hull would be a line segment in the real line. You can prove that another way, but it's a nice consequence of this theorem. Uh, okay, so before seeing the really insightful proof of this theorem, we should talk about how to even algebraically express points in the convex hull of a set of points in general, because it's going to be needed for the proof. All right, so let's draw a picture here. Imagine we have two points exactly, R1 and R2. The convex hull of these points is the line segment that has these points as endpoints. Okay, so what are the points on here and how can we describe them? So there's the midpoint, which is half R1 plus R2, half R2. Then there's the midpoint of this and R2, which is the average of those two, and that's a, a fourth of R1 plus three-fourths of R2. Similarly here, we'll have the point uh, three-fourths R1 plus a fourth R2. And we notice in these three situations that we have scalars multiplied by R1 and R2. They're non-negative and sum to one. This kind of makes sense. It's like we're placing a weight that determines how far we are from R1 and R2 collectively. You can also see that using vectors if you wanted to. And this phenomenon generalizes, like let's say we had three points R1, R2, R3. Then the center of mass of these points somewhere over here if we think about these as being written as vectors in the complex plane with two components, then this thing would be the average of these. And it actually literally is the average as complex numbers. And this is a third R1 plus a third R2 plus a third R3. Uh, so in general, if you want to describe a point in the convex hull of a whole bunch of points, and I'll put this in a box here so that we can use it in our proof. Points in the convex hull look like A1, R1, plus up to A n, R n, where these AIs are all non-negative and sum to one. Great. So now we can move on to the actual proof of this theorem using that fact. All right, so we'll start off by letting R be a root of the derivative. And we're trying to prove R is somewhere in the convex hull of these points R1 through Rn. We'll assume also that R is not a root of F. If R was a root of F, let's say for example that R was R2, um, then R is automatically in the convex hull of the points R1 through Rn. It's actually exactly one point in the convex hull, R2 itself. Or if you wanted, you could use 
uh, what we talked about here to say that we can write r, which is r2, as 0 r1 plus 1 r2 plus 0 times the rest of the roots. Um, and those coefficients add up to 1. You have one of them being 1 and the rest 0. Um, so let r be a root of f of z and not a root of f of z since we've taken care of that situation already. Okay, since r1 through rn are the complex roots of f, then f factors as some scalar times all these linear polynomials that are z minus any of these given roots, and then all multiplied. Okay, if we take the logarithm of both sides here, we'll get the logarithm of c plus the sum of the logarithms of all of these factors. And now differentiating this here, we'll get one over f of z times f prime of z. So we'll have f prime of z over f of z. This constant will disappear. And then here we'll have one over z minus ri for each i all added up. So the reason to even consider something like this is that we have information about both f prime and f of z. So you can do something with this expression. In particular, if we plug in z equals r, r is a root of f of z, f prime of z. f evaluated at r is non-zero because r is not a root of f. So here we get zero. And then here we have one minus, one over r minus r1 plus etc. one over r minus rn. Okay. We can write this in an interesting, cleaner way that's going to illuminate why this root has to be in the convex hull of these points. Let's multiply each of these by each of these um, fractions by its conjugate over its conjugate. If we do that, any number is multiplied, any complex number multiplied by its conjugate is the modulus of its squared. So at the bottom, we're going to get our minus r1, the modulus of r minus r1 squared up to r minus rn modulus squared. And then at the top, we're going to get the conjugate of r minus r1, which is the same as the conjugate of r minus the conjugate of r1, etc., up to the conjugate of r minus the conjugate of rn. Okay. So this is an expression that we have for r in terms of the ri's. So we notice we have these negative signs in front of the conjugates of each of the ri's. Let's move all of those factors to the other side. Then we'll have something like the conjugate of r1 over the modulus of r minus r1 squared plus etc. the modulus of rn sorry, the conjugate of Rn over R minus the minus Rn modulus squared, that's all of these negative terms moved over, equals, and then we'll have the conjugate of R times a bunch of things, 1 over the modulus of R minus R1 squared up to 1 over the modulus of R minus Rn squared, times r conjugate. Now you can start to see where this is going. We kind of have r here, but this is conjugate, and then we have scalar multiples of each of these ri's. Um, we have conjugates everywhere, so let's take all the conjugates off by conjugating each side. Okay, and I'm going to divide by this factor right here that we have is beside r. So we have something like uh, maybe let's actually call this entire huge thing, uh, I guess we used C before, so let's call this capital R. Right, if we divide by capital R, we get um, 1 over R, the modulus of R minus R1 squared uh, divided by R, R1, plus up to 1 over R minus 
Rn modulus squared over R times Rn equals little r. Okay, so let's take a look at this situation. We have r represented as scalars times each of the ri's all added up. And if we look at these scalars, right, the sum of the numerators is r itself. So these are all non-negative numbers. If we let a, i be these circle scalars, like a1 is this and a n is this, they're all non-negative and their sum is one. And so r then has to lie in the convex hull of r1 through rn. So it's a kind of a cool theorem that's a consequence of playing with the complex numbers and properties of conjugates of complex numbers in our modulus in a way that works out really, really cleanly to get the result that we want. So I hope you liked today's video. If you did, please click the like button. And if you'd like to see more videos like this, please subscribe to the channel.